Good to have all of you here today. My name is Matt Party, one of the pastors here. Very excited for this uh, season uh, that we're in right now with the fall and football starting and all the new people coming back to our city. We have just kicked off a new series in the book of Luke. We have some Bibles there in front. If you'd like to hold that, you can do that. If not, the verses will come up on the screen. But we're excited to be going through this new gospel uh, for us, this new series for us, because Luke is talking about how Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Each of the Gospels kind of have their own little nuance and their own audience. Matthew is speaking to the Jewish people. It quotes the Old Testament a whole bunch, uh, trying to explain to the Jewish people that Jesus is the Messiah. Mark is kind of more geared toward the Roman people, John toward all believers, and Luke was written mostly toward the Gentiles who the Jewish people believed were outside of God's plan and outside of God's will, and Luke is explaining to them that Jesus cares for everyone. He came to seek and save all that were lost. In this series that we're calling The Kingdom Come, we're very excited about because you and I, whether Jew or Gentile, regardless of our background or anything that we've experienced, we get to be a part of this kingdom. We're invited into this kingdom where God is the king of this kingdom, regardless of our past. Jesus wants to forgive us and invite us into this kingdom, to be a part of his kingdom, to come out of the kingdom of darkness and to be in his kingdom. And this kind of just reminds us of this old story of these battle of these kingdoms, the battles of good and evil. If you think about the movies that we love, you know, some of my favorite movies, people say, oh, what are your favorite movies? They're usually good against evil. You know, the Lord of the Rings kind of movies where you just clearly see, you know, this, this good thing trying to go against all these demons and evil things. People love Star Wars. I'm not so much into Star Wars. Don't judge me for that, please. Uh, there's this movie series out there. I think it's called Harry Potter. Never seen any of it. Don't read any of the books, but I know people love those too. And usually we're drawn to these movies where we're wishing that the, the good wins out in the end, Right? We're usually drawn to see maybe even some of these vigilante movies where we want to see evil punished. And the reason that we love these movies, and even though we kind of see the trailer and like, yeah, this is like a hundred other movies that I've seen, we're still drawn to it, and I believe that we're drawn to it because it's God's story. It resides in our heart. It's something that we're drawn to because it's an actual reality that we're going to see in Luke chapter 4. We live in this physical world, but we believe with all of our hearts there is a spiritual war going on all around us. It plays out in many ways in our lives and in the relationships we have and in the, the countries and the systems of this world, but there is no doubt in my mind, and it's re reflected so truly in Scripture, we see it over and over again, there is a battle between good and evil, and our God is going to win. He's the victorious God, and he is inviting us into this battle. So here's the big idea for today. Jesus shows us how to resist darkness and leverage our lives for his kingdom. Jesus is showing us in this passage in Luke chapter 4, which we're going to read, how to resist temptation. How to invite us into this battle. There's warriors. There's, there's people with cudgels swinging at each other, trying to kill each other. This war that's happening, this battle that's going on, this isn't just this life that we're going to coast through and just kind of just do our earthly thing and live in this comfortable world. We're being reminded that we're in a battle and we have to pick up our cudgel and start swinging it. Jesus said, I came with uh, uh, with force, and the kingdom of God is taken through violence. Now, this for us, of course, is not a physical violence, but a spiritual battle, a spiritual violence that we live in our hearts and our minds, and Jesus says it's real, 
And as we respond to temptation in our lives, we're either winning or losing those battles. I remember as a young Christian, you know, someone talking about like, oh, what's Christendom doing? And, and there were these surveys and books always written about what is Christianity all about? What are Christians like in this country? And I was always fascinated by that. And I remember pastors sharing with me when I was a young Christian saying this, do you want to know what Christianity is doing these days? Ask yourself what you're doing these days. Man, that really impacted me. What I'm doing, how I'm living my life, the decisions that I make and how I speak and what I think about and what I watch and what I eat and how I treat people and all the decisions that I make, every one of those that we make together add up to what Christianity is portraying in this world. And Jesus is saying the battle's real and I want to encourage you to fight against temptation as he does so that we're leveraging our life for the kingdom of God. So let's jump into this battle. Jesus is going to be fasting for this long period of time. He's drawn out into the desert. He's going to go toe-to-toe with Satan. We believe with all of our heart that this passage, uh, as long as many other passages in Scripture, that Satan is real. The kingdom of God is real. And Satan is trying to destroy that kingdom. And he has this interaction with Satan. So let's go to Luke chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God... Tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, and he quotes Psalm 91 here, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. What we see in this passage again that Satan is real. He's throwing out these temptations to Jesus. He's trying to get Jesus to be tripped up, and he keeps questioning him. This is one of the uh, the tools of Satan. He's like, if this is really true, like I don't think this is really true. He tries to lie to us, and he tries to throw doubt into our Christian beliefs. And he does this three times with Jesus. If you're really this. If you're really the son of God, why don't you do these things and serve yourself instead of serving this God of yours? We see three times this pattern, which is important to notice patterns in Scripture, that Jesus answers Satan with Scripture. He answers him with the word of God to correct his lies and to correct the doubt that he's trying to create and bring in God's truth. So I'm going to break this into these three temptations, and here's the first point. The first temptation that he throws out to him because he's hungry, and he says, do this miraculous thing to turn this stone into bread. He's, and here's the first point. Satan is trying to get us to satisfy our hunger outside of the will of God. Satan in this situation is trying to get Jesus to satisfy his physical hunger outside of the will of God. Now, an important clarifier here, of course, we all need food. We all need to have responses to our hunger to eat. 
Jesus eventually did eat. At this moment, he was being called into the desert for this time of fasting, and so it wasn't that period of time right at that moment for him to do this miraculous thing and eat this bread. Of course, God gives us these physical pleasures in this world. Those are not bad things. He gives us these cravings and these hungers and these appetites, but every one of us has an opportunity to respond to those hungers and appetites that God's given us in the will of God or to go outside of the will of God to fulfill these desires. And that is what Satan is trying to throw at us. Every beautiful blessing from God, all the wonderful things that we get to eat and drink and see and experience affection or experience physical relationships inside the will of God, all these different hungers and cravings that he's given us are not sinful things. They're good things. They're gifts from God. And just because we're tempted by things, that does not mean that we're in sin. That's another important clarification. Sometimes we can shame ourselves and we can feel bad for all these temptations and all these thoughts that we have and these crazy sinful thoughts that will come into our mind at random times. We'll say, oh, what's wrong with me? Nothing's wrong with you. You are in the spiritual battle. And just like Satan was whispering these things to Jesus, hey, why don't you do this outside of the will of God? Why don't you do this outside of the will of God? We are no different in our earthly experience, experiencing temptations and experiencing lies. But it's what we do after that temptation that is so important and what defines who we are. And Jesus had to go through these very things so that he could relate to us and be our Savior. Hebrews 2 says it so well. It says this. A lot of Hebrews is talking about how Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the greatest high priest. Jesus is the Savior. It's all about how amazing Jesus is. And here it says in verse 17, For this reason he, Jesus, had to be made like them, that's us, fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Isn't that awesome? When you and I are being tempted, we can relate to Jesus, and Jesus can relate to us. No temptation has ever happened to any human being of all time that Jesus was not tempted in. The scriptures tell us that. We can relate to him. He can be our savior. He can be our friend. He can be a brother to us in this battle because Jesus understood temptation. And the Bible says he had to go through these temptations so that he might comfort us and empower us and help us and say, yeah, I know what it's like to go through these things but he did it perfectly so that he might sacrifice himself on the cross for the atonement of our sins, the perfect lamb, the perfect atonement that overcome, overcame temptation in order to save us. You know, to be honest, when I think about this, this hunger and this craving that we all have inside of us in this fork in the road of how we decide, you know, it's a battle for all of us. And I was even joking with Mary Lynn lately just how as you get older, it seems like it actually gets worse. I thought as I got older as a Christian that those temptations would go down. But I just was telling her, like, you know, it was one of those days where I just wanted to, like, veg out in this big recliner And I imagine me just sprawled out in this recliner, not with just one TV in front of me, but four TVs. So I could just watch every football game that was on. And on my left, there would be potato chips and pizza and over here, donuts and all these cool beverages. And maybe even somebody would come up behind me and just start rubbing my shoulders. You know, that'd be a good day. I would love to live that life all the visual comforts, all the food I ever wanted to eat, all the just laziness and comfort and pleasures of this world. That sounds awesome to me. I know that God is calling me to not live that kind of comfortable life. 
He's calling every one of us to not live this selfish life where we're only serving ourselves and we're only consumed by our own comforts and our own appetites. He's calling us out of that to say, set aside these things and live in a way that's in accordance with me. Let me ask you that question this morning. Are you willing to trust God to provide for your hungers in his way and in his timing? Let that soak into your heart. Let God ask you that question through the Spirit this morning. We have these hungers and appetites. We're so tempted to take the shortcuts and say, yeah, but I deserve this. I've earned this. I'm entitled to this thing. And I know it's a sin. The Bible says it clearly it's a sin, but I'm different from everybody else. I've earned this. And if I do this in secret, it's not going to hurt anybody else. I don't care what God wants. I don't care about his timing. I want to please myself. And even in those moments alone where we think that we can do it in secrecy and maybe even get away with it and it's not hurt any, anybody else, we're actually building the kingdom of the enemy. Because in the enemy's kingdom, it is live for yourself. Do whatever you want. You are the God of this kingdom and you don't have to surrender to anybody else. But God says, no, if you want to follow me, if you want to trust me, you surrender those things to him. And I know we need this reminder all the time. Man does not live on bread alone. I love this response that Jesus has. He says, Satan, you're so foolish. You think that life is just about bread and satisfying a physical hunger? We all need that every day to be reminded that this life is not about bread. It's not about money. It's not about cool beverages. It's not about the comforts and satisfying ourselves. We live in a spiritual world. We can't see it, but we know in our hearts it's true, and the Spirit is opening up our eyes all the time to this spiritual battle that's going on. Let's move on to the second part, verse 5, this Battle continues. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. Wow, that sounds pretty cool. It's been given to me. Pretty interesting that Satan says he's controlling all this. And Satan says, I can give it to anyone I want. You're this special person. I'm going to give it to you. All you have to do is worship me. Verse 7 says, if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, no, I'm not going to worship you. I worship the Lord, my God, and serve him only. This expression that we use a lot in our world that comes from the scripture is, what would you sell out your soul for? What would we give in exchange for our soul? He's saying, I want to give you authority. I want to give you splendor. I want to give you fame and popularity. I think that's a pretty tempting thing for every one of us. I will give you power and influence, and everybody will think you're amazing, and and you'll just be the person. All you have to do is just turn away from this God and let me be your boss. Here's the second thing. Satan wants us to be more concerned about what people think and popularity than what God desires for us. It's okay to want to have people like you. It's okay to want to be popular and and to be, you know, known and to be influential, to have, you know, influence over other people. But how often are we so tempted to put that above God as an idol in our lives? If we want to follow Jesus, and I hope you know this, if not, maybe this is the first time that you're hearing this, that following Jesus is really difficult. The forgiveness of sins is amazing. It's the greatest gift that you're ever going to be given. But if you want to accept the gift of Jesus Christ and believe in him and trust him, he's now going to ask you to walk in a way to follow him that might not make you popular. It might actually make people think less of you because of the choices in life that you make. And Satan is saying, man, forget all that. You can be popular. You can fit in. 
You can be like the other college students. Don't stand out. Go and party with them and do all the things that they do. You don't want to be different. You want to be liked. Do the things with your body that everybody else is doing so that you can be cool. And that's such a huge temptation as a college student. But you know what? That temptation continues on as city people, as older people in the community. When we have families and we want to be popular, we want to fit in. We want to do the things that other people are doing and compete with them in these earthly realms. And it can become an idol. Galatians 1.10 says this. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I've shared with you before over the years, probably one of my biggest struggles in life is being a people pleaser. I don't know if any of you struggle with that. But sometimes when you're feeling insecure, you just want to be Mr. Harmonious or you want to please everybody, these times of wanting to please people and make them happy can actually draw us out of the will of God. And I know God has had to talk to me about that many times over the decades. Matt, what's your goal in life? Are you trying to win the approval of human beings? Or are you trying to win the approval of me? And I have to answer that over and over and over again. You are my God. I want to serve you. I want to serve Christ. I don't want to serve mankind. The third area that I want to highlight as this temptation that Jesus is battling Satan is, is starting in verse 9. It says this, The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered and said, do not put your Lord, your God, to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. What he's saying here is the Bible says that if you throw yourself off from here, Jesus, we can witness this cool, miraculous thing where the angels are going to swoop down and catch you so that you're not splattered all over the stones. And Jesus saying, I could do that, and the angels might do that, but I'm not going to put the Lord to the test. I'm not here to just do these miraculous, exciting things. And the third point is this. Satan tempts us to live recklessly with our lives. Isn't that so true? The little decisions that we make in life can actually be reckless. And I think about this, not just in the, you know, we think oftentimes in like the the criminal types of things of like what we might do with our money or what we, we might do with our sexuality. But I even think about the reckless things that we do that might not always come to mind about our thoughts, our unforgiveness, our hatred toward people, our attitudes in life. We can be very reckless with all these different areas of our lives that maybe have short-term consequences, and maybe they have long-term consequences. But God is saying, I want you to take care of your lives. I want you to walk with me and not be reckless with it. You know, when as we go through this experience, sometimes we can be like an adrenaline junkie in life where we're wanting to experience things outside of God's will. We're curious, and we think, wow, that kind of looks cool to live like the world. That kind of looks exciting. And we could actually play up in our mind, which is what Satan is whispering to us, is that this Christian life is boring. You're not experiencing the fullness of life. Matter of fact, that was the first temptation that happened in the garden with Adam and Eve, and he hasn't really come up with any new plays. He said to Adam and Eve, that's what God told you life is? No, he's trying to hold out on you. And if you eat this apple, if you go outside of God's will, you're really going to have an awesome life. He's trying to punish you by these boundaries. And Adam and Eve gave into it. And they said, yeah, we don't want to miss out on life. And they sinned, and it brought destruction. It hurt their life. It was not the abundant life. 
And he's still whispering the same thing to us. Live recklessly or you're going to miss out on life. And it's 180 degrees different from what Jesus says. He says, no, I want to give you the abundant life. What would you give in exchange for your, for your soul? He has the very words of eternity. I have a picture of a guy named uh, Brad Gobright, and he, uh, one of the most famous climbers, freestyle climbers in the world. He's in Cal- he was in California, and this guy just set all kinds of records with climbing and difficult slopes that he, uh, he went after and, and different places that were timed. And you can see how fast you can get up to these peaks. And he set world records. He's pretty, pretty well known in this world of rock climbing. And when you think of kind of that adrenaline junkie and, and doing risky things and kind of crazy things, you know, hanging off the edge of cliffs, you think, yeah, that guy was like really living, Right. But he was reckless with his life. Anybody that does this is reckless with their life. And unfortunately, at a young age, in 2019, just about two years ago, he fell. He was climbing with his friend named Aiden. Uh, The ropes slipped through his harness. They both fell. His friend hit the ledge and broke all kinds of bones and was really injured. But Brad bounced off of this cliff and fell another 1,000 feet and lost his life. He was living recklessly. It was exciting. It was exhilarating, but it cost him his life. You know, I think sometimes we're living like that spiritually. The decisions that we're making, kind of walking that line with God, and we're not literally hanging off of a rock cliff and maybe going to lose our physical life, but we're hanging on the cliff of temptation. We're hanging on the cliffs of entertaining sins that we know God doesn't want us to do. And as we continue to entertain those and play them out in our mind, we're actually in greed or hatred or lust or whatever it might be. That's actual sin because God knows those lead to an actual acting out on those sins. And we have this desire to live on the edge spiritually, and it leads to bad places. I don't know if you remember this when you were taking your driving test, but when you were learning to take a left turn, for example, and you get into that turn lane, and you're waiting for the oncoming traffic to pass so that you can take a left turn safely, the driving instructor would say, hey, when you're in this lane, keep your wheel straight. Keep your tires straight. Why is that so important? Because if someone comes up and rear ends you, you're going to go safely forward. But if you're cranking your wheel to the left, waiting for the oncoming traffic, and someone hits you from behind, you're actually going to go dangerously into the oncoming traffic. What a great driving tip, right? I think spiritually many of us are getting right up to that boundary of where we want to sin and we're thinking about it, we're daydreaming about it and we're cranking that wheel toward sin. And we're like, well, I don't, I don't know if I really want to do this but, but you're cranking that wheel and you're just sitting there and all you need is just a little nudge from Satan to push you right into danger. And God is saying, don't live like that. Don't be a part of the enemy's kingdom where you're so enticed by temptation that you're just ready to go in and wreck your life. Do not put the Lord, your God, to the test. Remember that we're in a battle together. We have to resist these things, that we're fighting something real And every one of us, God wants to give this abundant life. He's trying to steer us away from things that are so dangerous that are going to hurt us, hurt our families, hurt our friendships, and hurt our influence for Christ. As I close this, let me bring back the attention to Christ and these temptations that he went through. Christ alone is the one that overcame all these temptations. We have sinned and we have given in to these temptations. And this closing moment here that I want to apply to our lives is that Christ alone overcomes our future temptations. He's the one that gives us this power. 
but he's also the one that's overcome our past failures. And if you're like me, you might have been sitting here reading these verses and thinking, man, I've fallen short. I've given in to these temptations. I've thought about them. I've acted on them. And I, this is not good. It has driven a wedge between us and God. And the reason it's so important to acknowledge that you need rescued and you need forgiven and you need saved is because Christ alone is the answer to that. Not only can he help us in the future, but so importantly, you only begin this relationship with Jesus by realizing that he's the solution for our past failures. He died on the cross so that you might be forgiven of those things to have a brand new start. And if you're sitting here feeling convicted about the sin in your life and you think, man, maybe I should give up. No, actually God's saying, I want you to start over again. But not in your own effort, not in your own trying. You need to start over again with a clean slate through the forgiveness of Jesus. That's why he died on the cross, to remove your sins so that you can actually walk in victory in the spirit with him. We're gonna sing a song called Christ Alone here in a moment and we're gonna take communion and we'll remember that we get a new start every time when we're experiencing Jesus in this way. Let's pray together.